Okay, we can start. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the fourth Innovations in Digital Design webinar. Innovations in Digital Design, IDD, is an online platform for sharing innovative research ideas and design works in the digital design field. We aim to explore the nature and future of design by showcasing the outstanding works of young designers and scholars from all over the world. IDD operates once per month, offering oral presentations and discussions in English. All recordings are uploaded to YouTube and Bilibili and available for free to all. And today we're happy to invite Ren Jiatian from Harvard GSD and doctoral candidate Xi Ming Zhong from Aalto University to share their recent papers presented at Kedra and Ikedi about artificial intelligence in architectural design. So first, we're happy to have Ren Jiatian to introduce his recent research of inactive gen uh, genesis towards generative architecture with human-centric artificial intelligence. Ren Jiatian holds a master's degree of design studies in technology from Harvard Graduate School of Design and a bachelor's degree in architecture from Harbin Institute of Technology. Currently, he is an AR effect engineer at TikTok, working on TikTok's AR effect platform in Effect House. Welcome, Ren Jia. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Wei, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, ID, for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to share, um, like, my previous work and understanding about like architecture and AI in general uh, with the uh, CAD community. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna just. Can I can I see my screen share now? Um, yeah. Yes. So uh, okay, cool. Uh, then I'll just get started. Um, yeah. So today my topic is um, I slightly rephrased the title called from Inactive Genesis, which was the title for my thesis at the GSD M MDES program, uh, to generative game because I think generative game is probably like a more uh generic form framework for. Uh, this sort of like uh, exploration for generative architecture using AI uh, technologies. Yeah, um, yeah. This is uh, this was what I uh, worked on. Um, yeah, as my like thesis at the GSD, which is like a conclusion of my explorations uh, of using neural networks for generative architecture. So uh, at the beginning, it's a very simple question, and also the motivation of the thesis is, is that as architecture students who um, came from like a more of like a um, science and uh, like math background uh, during my high school, I sort of like uh, had a time struggling to understand the design process because it doesn't have any explicit knowledge or formula that you can follow to generate like the architect designs. But instead you learn them explicitly through a almost like a partnership uh, working pattern where you learn by doing the design and uh, receiving critiques from the domain experts like your um, like instructors. So um, I have always, always been wondering this question, like how do we design architecture? So obviously the question centers on the word design, how we um, think about the design activities in our architecture. So I would like to uh, borrow the concept from neuro, uh, cognitive neuroscientists because um, I'm generally interested in um, like the cognitive aspect of architecture as well as um, the, like there was a, like a, um, like also, I think this idea also kind of like impacted by the train of uh, computational neuro neurocognitive science studies at uh, the, which was um, in this we was kind of like a blooming studies in uh, across Harvard MIT when I was where I was studying. So um, like as designed by one of the uh, cognitive scientists, um, the design activities like a, like a human cognitive activity finding solutions for a big problem. So it sort of like differs from the uh, like. Or inference problems, um, and also in in um, but it's also like uh, we have other like common tasks that rely hugely on our common sense, and also is which is our you post problem. Um, where computer science they call them is like you can't really uh, define the like process explicitly, but rather it relies a lot of on the a prior knowledge and also like uh, experiences and other like um, things that are not. Um, like formulated or um, easily designed, these are easily defined by like those explicit knowledge we have. So, um, so how do we study those kind of like uh, questions or like uh, human behaviors? Um, 
one of the like uh, aspiring research trends at MIT uh, CCL was to they call it this process to reverse engineer human intelligence. Uh, this concept was long pro ago proposed by uh, like uh, David Marr, um, a also a computational uh, like a, a neuro neuro neuroscientist. So he proposed the uh, interesting like thesis that to study a human activity um, using like AI. Uh, you don't usually start with from the biological aspects, so which was like a typical research method. Um, but instead, um, as the someone I, I believe he's from computational computer science background, uh, so he proposed this level this new methodology of studying brain activity on, um, from computation to the implementation. So instead of um, studying the biological foundations of how your how you see the world, how your uh, like uh, how your the cells inside your eyes works to perceive the lights uh, and and lights and rays and things like that. Uh, he first proposed a computational model of human vision, like uh, as you all, we all see today, like we have um, like a like a wide, um, variety of different neural networks for image recognition or object recognition. Um, like and then after we have this kind of computational model, we propose the algorithms to achieve certain tasks. And using these algorithms, we can reversely infer how human brain works. Um, yeah, then these, I would like to say that um, this thesis has its own drawbacks, but uh, I, would, I, I think this is brings a new aspect or a new uh, idea to the, um, to the, to our design domain as well. It's like, instead of studying how we, uh, how according to our brains of how you actually do the design uh, using your brain neurons, uh, why don't we just propose a machine that can achieve those like design tasks um, using whatever like computer science methods. And then we can sort of like infer how human design architecture as well. So this is like the ultimate goal of why, why I started this thesis. And uh, yes, because of my like uh, interest in how design functions or how we design as human beings. Yeah, but to achieve that, we have to use a computational approach uh, first for now, um, because the like uh, yeah, because it's probably easier to modeling the process and achieve the certain those, those tasks. Then um, it's probably faster than actually doing the brain studies of those activities. Yeah, uh, one of those examples that um, the computer science people use um, and has achieved those results is the you know object recognition and computer vision. So they uh, develop like a lot of uh, like object recognition models, and after those, uh, they're using neural net. They are using neural networks for these for those mm, for those models, obviously. And then they decompose those middle layers of the neural networks, and you can see that um, it kind of like uh, reflects how the machine recognize whether something is a cup. It's first, it has some like high level information of the objects uh, edges and uh, the overall. Um, the overall like lay layout of the images, and then uh, it kind of like recognize the materials and textures and colors and radiance of the images to um, yeah as a in a, in the lower level of the neural network. So yeah, this sort of like um, like inspired me to think about like how those computer scientists use the like a uh, uh, machine vision as an example. How we can like um, like use this approach in design domain as well, for architecture design as well. So I'm thinking about um, what if we can propose a computational model of, of architectural intelligence, and then we can infer the neurobiological foundation of the architecture intelligence, and then we can learn how human actually do the architecture design. Yeah. Um, so to realize this vision, it's definitely a vision because we don't yet have a machine that can do this task, right? And uh, yeah, to realize this vision, we um, like, I think, the important thing is here is how we design this machine, or in another way, like what we are interested in is, is how to develop an AI that can sort of like design things or generate designs for us based on the conditions we provide to them. Um, yeah, so before we start to how we implement the machine, um, I think we can like uh, take a look into how we design those kind of like machines in the first place. Um, like borrowing the concept from the um, Alan Turing's work uh, computing machinery and intelligence. So uh, where he proposed a famous uh, imitation game, which also known as the Turing test, um, 
in the in the in the in the, in the, in the later in the later in the later years. Uh, he proposed the, the model that um the or the methodology to test whether a machine has surpassed human intelligence uh, in a way such that uh, if you put a machine and a human um like in two different rooms and uh, like uh, you then give them different tasks, for example, translation or uh, generate some like uh, passages given a task, given a topic. And if the results from those two different rooms um, cannot be, differences cannot be told by like a human being, then you can say the machine passes the, the Turing test or passes the imitation game. Um, yeah, so I would say the imitation game is sort of like the ruler or the kind of like a center to measure the intelligence of a general computational machine. Uh, but for architecture, what is the the what what how should we address the imitation game? Because architecture is sometimes like uh, it's not a definite process, and uh, you have those like the typical design process. Like you have some environment, like the variables or um, like description about your um, design tasks. And after some, you know, for now, it's still a black box intelligence uh, that we don't yet uncover what's in, inside it. But you always spit out some outcomes or designs um, iterations of based on those environment variables. Um, and since we always call those, um, like, uh, for historic regions, we we'll call those like a process, like a generative uh, design or something. So I would like to propose this machine to be called generative machine. And those imitation games for those generative machines, um, uh, is the generative game. That's where this topic of the, this, um, yeah, this, uh, come from. Yeah. So, uh, in any case, I, I would like to say that uh, this is like my own personal approach to um, kind of like propose a methodology, or like a generic methodology for uh, like architecture and AI. Uh, and uh, the structure of the generative game, I would like to say that uh, I quoted uh, Michelle Williams, which is the founder of MIT Media Lab, and also the um, like uh, he wrote a really like awesome book about architecture and AI. And he also proposed the first uh, like theoretical foundation of the CAD, which I think is one of the first uh, articles in the CAD industry, uh, is that any of the CAD system can be seen to compose of three parts, the representation system, the generation system, and the testing system. So the representation system is a data structure we use to represent our designs. For example, if we use the, the like uh, random models, it's the 3DM file, and it it's using the, the BREPs to represent our designs as the geometries. Um, yeah, or Revit, we have like uh, the Revit files and you know those like beam files and it, it, it's actually just data, right? Uh, and for generations, this is the interesting part. Um, and there is, this is where the actual intelligence came, is that how you use algorithms to generate the environment uh, variables into outcomes. This is actually the most complicated part as well, or the most challenging part as well, um, yeah. And after these, you have the testing system to, it's just like uh, how you measure the success of your generation. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, like the so-called generative design or AI journey in architecture designs follow this kind of like pattern. Uh, yeah, here are some of the uh, like uh, early studies that this is one is, I think, believe it's from the Autodesk um, and um, yeah, Autodesk generative group or something. And they used the uh, like, uh, uh, what is it called? It's like profit and solar energy to measure whether uh, like a certain rules uh, generated uh, like urban layouts uh, can be optimized. Yeah, they were at back, back, it was like uh, back in 2018 and they were still using the genetic algorithms um, and uh, yeah, and to, it's sort of like a rule-based algorithm to get the, to optimize the results of uh, like the urban layouts. Yeah. Um, but then we have, uh, neural networks, uh, instead of like using express, explicit rules to represent the design process, you can now kind of like sample a distribution of the designs from a data set that you provide to the machine. And this approach, we typically call it um, implicit approach of learning. Um, and uh, yeah, this is kind of like, I think this dates back to the, again, to Turing's passage. Uh, the Turing's impossible, sorry, the Turing's important article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, that uh, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult's man, so we can produce one that simulates a child's. So it learns from scratch, it builds its own um, understanding of the world based on the data you provided to it. So it probably can think differently as the human brains. Yeah. This sort of, you can, you can see that the, the human and the machine intelligence sort of diverge here. 
um, like from David Mars proposal. Um, but I, I think that's actually fine. So uh, like it doesn't have to be one-to-one -one mapping or like exactly the same, but it's still this kind of like um, inspirational approach still works for think the a journey of AI in architecture. Yeah. Um, yeah, and after the invention of neural networks and after we have enough computational power to democratize those kind of like neural networks, we um, a lot of like research in CAD industry began to pick up neural networks in generally architecture events. So for example, uh, the GSC graduate stand is um, like famous architect Archigan. It's one of the first using the uh, like, I think back back in that time, it was still kind of like called stack or something like you, stack multiple layers of um like multiple like multiple layers of pixel peaks to um general architecture like designs yeah um and also there are other representations using neural networks such as using the uh convolutional message passing network which was a kind of like a graph neural network to translate a um like function layout uh, pro a graph or program graph to a uh, floor plan layout. This was the one of the ECCV papers published by Autodesk Research Group. So they were using the ConvMPN to generate uh, layouts based on the input graph. Um, yeah, and also you can represent things in voxels uh, or point clouds in the 3D formats. Uh, but I think because we have quite limited data, 3D data, um, like those kind of like research, are still in its early stage, even today. Even we have Nerf and all this kind of like um, cool like 3D generation, it's still um, the amount of data we have in 3D compared to 2D is still like not on the same level. Yeah. Um, yeah. After we see like all those advancements in AI in architecture, um, yeah, typically in a machine learning course, they always, or a computer, like, yeah, in machine learning course, we'll always ask, these questions, can we do better? Um, yeah, so the problem, uh, there are a lot of problems for the existing like approaches uh, in both rule-based systems and also those neural network-based systems um, in the sense that it can be divided into different aspects. Like for example, for the representation, it's not usable in the real world. Uh, it's not like universal enough. Like for example, the Archigan images, you cannot directly convert that to a usable model like or a uh, usable rabbit file um, and it's not using any like human-centric evaluation metrics you don't take into the uh, you don't have a way to measure those uh, like metrics uh, explicitly and because they are for like the pixel piece it's basically sample the distribution of images uh, from your given data and it just uh, learns it just takes whatever it has in the data like even some bias to the generated results. Um, yeah, and uh, more importantly for the generation system, um, like uh, it's either constrained by rules or um, like those neural networks, um, like they are sort of like they're not scalable and uh, not you cannot add any other like metrics to them apart from the predefined like uh, peaks to peaks uh, methodology, yeah. Um, so how can I improve this? So for the representation system, uh, I would say like one interesting thing that uh, like, sorry, one thing that caught my interest uh, at that time was that uh, why not we use uh, like a beam or sort of like semantic uh, like uh, graph or other data structure to represent the architecture then? Cause you know, Revit is just, you can define the elements of the architectural uh, so you can define the architectural elements by using the type of the objects and also the location of the like uh, met the location or the actual uh, dimension metrics of those like architectural objects. And uh, together they can generate a graph that you can one to one mapping the architectural design to a data structure. So beam is sort of like the very precise representation of the architectural design itself. Yeah. Um, and for the testing system, we don't really have any uh, measures, have any ways to do that in, in a human centric ways. Like we, we don't really evaluate the quality of the space that gets generated from these neural networks in 3D, right? Uh, and there is no way that we can take into the like domain knowledge of human experts to optimize the neural networks uh, using piece to piece or other like image based approach. 
Um, so um, that something that I take inspiration from is um, also from uh, the the the, the um, like the infant's learning process. Uh, like there are like multiple representations of the um, like infant's learning process. One of them, I think, is inactive learning. What is called inactive learning. So it's sort of like a, a experimental world by uh, actually using the objects. For example, they learn the intuitive physics by throwing the objects around and they see that it bounces against the wall so that it, he, the, the infants got to learn that, oh, like these objects, it's sort of like a, like a collider or it collides with each other and, uh, and it, just, it stops. So like that's how we get the intuitive physics um, by manipulating the world or interacting with the world. Yeah. Um, this is kind of like similar to the like another like almost another notion or another like um paradigm of learning is what we call reinforcement learning so reinforcement learning doesn't um it doesn't like learn the data in the sort of like in as i i would call those like a uh, previous learning methods a uh, representation learning it's not my personal like way of addressing it also like uh, some people call them representation learning because they are basically learning the representation of your designs by sampling the distribution of the specific um, like elements from your data sets. So by reinforcement learning is sort of a difference. It assumes that you have an agent, which is the AI, the AI itself, and it has an environment and the AI interacts with the environment and learns, um, gradually learns how to um, like perform actions to change the environment and uh, like um, and obtain some rewards. So one of the important, uh, one of the interesting examples is um, the, uh, for sure, the uh, AlphaGo game that the it uses for like uh, tree search and also uh, I, I forgot what exactly the algorithm, sorry, the neural network was in probably PPO or something, um, and also like it has gained a lot of like superhuman intelligence uh, performance in a lot of like aspects such as the Atari games. And you may also heard that recently they also beat the human players in uh, like uh, tactic games such as Dota or uh, yeah, or like more complicated games. Yeah, uh, not to mention the AlphaGo um, games that beats um, these adults. Yeah, um, and uh, like yeah, another interesting example in the in the in that field or the reinforcement learning process is the, also the paper by OpenAI from 2019 is that they train the agents to play head and seek. Uh, it's actually a paper about like a multi-agent uh, like reinforcement learning. So you can see that interestingly, the agents gonna gradually learn to steal away the letters um, to uh, so that the enemy cannot catch them uh, and so that they can lock the the doors. Yeah. So this is uh, like a really interesting like observation uh, such that uh, you can see that the um, we can probably train AI to manipulate the environment uh, or to assemble certain architectural elements to achieve certain results that we want them to achieve in terms of the architectural quality. Yeah, so this is a really important uh, precedent study, the uh, like multi-agent machine learning uh, paper. Uh, yeah, I would say this is probably like the most important paper, like uh, in, in like the actual most important paper that uh, I got inspiration from during my time, yeah. Um, this reminds me, like later on, there was a, some other works of, uh, like from, for example, from Autodesk to learn how to assemble uh, certain like uh, industry design objects based on the command set uh, and the, also using reinforcement learning. Yeah. Um, yeah, also in 2021, there was another paper called uh, Design um, Spatial Assembly, which used reinforcement learning to assemble architectural elements together to achieve certain results or, uh, to surpass certain like uh, evaluation metrics. Although they didn't, I, I don't think I saw how they defined the design metrics, but the evaluation metrics, but I think this is an important paper as well. Like it shows you how we understand architectural as uh, fabrication and assembly or assemblage of architectural elements. Uh, and in this sort of like representation, it's, it's still learning the representation, but it's not learning the drawings of architecture, but instead it's learning the tectonic aspects of architecture uh, using the intelligent assemblage agent. Yeah. Um, yeah, also another, um, like something that has also been in my mind was um, like uh, 
Bernard Rudowski's book, Architecture Without Architects, is that in, in the sense that um, the early um, vernacular architecture in the human his civilization, uh, they don't really have like uh, esteemed architecture. So these sort of like, but those architecture spaces had high quality. And we can see those architecture as uh, those like uh, a total image picture of architecture from of human intelligence where our ancestors uh, learned how to manipulate the environments or to assemble different elements from the environments to create a shelter such that it can shelter people from the harsh of the, uh, the environments and to live a better life. Yeah. Um, so this way of thinking or this like uh, ideology of architecture that sees that as an assembly or um, like architectonics uh, approach uh, is sort of like what's the foundational of this? What's the foundation of my paper, Inactive Genesis? Yeah, uh, I think I'm a little bit run, uh, like behind my schedule, but I, I'll probably so the rest of it is just like a technical aspects of how I actually implemented this uh, reinforcement learning environment. I'll probably go through some of the parts quickly, and uh, you can probably ask more uh, in the in the Q and A sections. So. Um, Therefore, uh, after analyzing those like contents um, of representation learning and um, of architecture, uh, I proposed this kind of like what I call the inactive genesis during my during the time I wrote all the thesis that uh, we can create inactive learning environments using reinforcement learning to train an intelligent agent that manipulates a grasshopper uh, beam assembly script to generate a space. And this space can be evaluated by a AI agent, uh, another AI agent in Unity that navigates in the space and speed out a rewards of this um, or evaluation of the space. And um, this rewards is feedback, sorry, is then fed back to the generative neural networks that manipulates a GH graph to optimize the generation such that the rewards can be higher. Yeah, this is a little bit like um, not so straightforward, but you can think of uh, the process. Like here is um, like a, a, a stupid AI agent at first. You throw the stupid AI agent into uh, into like a like a, a mass of uh, walls and columns and slabs uh, in the three D world. Then it sort of like uh, constructs a space using those elements you give it uh, based on a certain commands commands. Um, and then after it finished the construction, it walks around the space and um, give you a rewards of the space. Um, and then it will also use the rewards to opt optimize its next construction so that it can pr improve itself over time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the I think the general beam part is straightforward. Like I just create a grasshopper library that uh, have several APIs such as uh, you can create um, the three elements of architecture inside the space. You can create a wall uh, by specifying its starting points at any point. Uh, you can also also its height in, in the later explorations. You can create a column uh, by specifying its location and also a floor plan or a, a slab. Sorry, it's a, a slab. It's actually called a slab inside this structure. And uh, using those simple elements, it can generate architectural spaces. So for example, this is one of the... Um, experiments I created for um, trying to replicate those the plan of um, the Barcelona Pavilion by Miss Manero, um, where you place like several columns and walls and then you generate the architecture spaces after certain steps. Um, yeah. So to do that, I created this Grasshopper library and it sort of like has all these implementations and you can call the, you can generate the walls and columns and uh, and also has the API to add a wall, add a column in certain places in the graph, in the in the in the in the space. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can see these are some of the experimentations I, I, I did. So the the number of uh, the the walls and columns are actually indefinite because it's sort of like it's sort of like the parameter that the agent is gonna learn during the process. Yeah. Uh, these are some of the results that I generated. And after it generates the, the space, it's gonna walk around the space and uh, speed out a, a like evaluation of the space based on two metrics I give it. So first metrics is the accessibility of the space. 
uh, like at first do a division of the space and generate a Hamiltonian path of the space. And the agent gonna just follow the Hamiltonian path and traverse the space in a um, like in a non-repetitive pattern so that it visit all the sections of the space for only once and only once. And after it visits the space along the Hamiltonian path, uh, it generates a score. Uh, so of how many like areas of the space he has visited. So this shows how the accessibility of the plan, like whether you have some dead areas where you cannot access. And on the other hand, uh, I create another like test matrix to measure the transparency of the space. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this part is like you can you, you like you can understand that as uh, it sort of like takes the phenomenal aspects of architecture uh, to experience the space in the first person point of view. Um, yeah, as you can see in this example, the agents are trying to go across the wall, but it can't. So there are some areas of the floor plan that is not accessible. Then it's sort of like a reduce the score, uh, the reverse of the generation. Uh, this is like how I compute the Hamiltonian path of the floor plan. Uh, and now comes the interesting part is how I compute the transparency of the, of the journey uh, space. So uh, this was very speculative, I would say. Like it's sort of like a, not like a, a very, it's not pro mathematic proven uh, approach, but it sort of like translates the definition of calling rows transparency in a mathematical way. Uh, how I compute the transparency of the space is by compute by taking its depth image um, and then compute the edge of the depth image as you can see here the transition from a um, like a close point to a deep point um, is sort of like represents that there's another space behind the um, the interface between you and that space so take take this kind of like space that calling raw referenced in one of Corbusier's Kobusi, drawing. Um, I forgot the name of the house, but uh, he, this is one of the example Colin Rowe explicitly referenced as a good example of spatial transparency. Uh, and the way that I interpret it, and also by his writing, is that um, Colin Rowe defines transparency as the coexistence of two different space of different depths in the same perspectival view. So those edge in the deep depth map represents the number of transitions or uh, the amount of transitions between the spatial depths in the same perspectival view. Yeah. Uh, it also includes the, like, uh, it also includes the literal transparency and also the phenomenal transparency. I didn't differentiate between those, but it sort of represents both. Um, so therefore, I do a depth detection of the sorry edge detection of the depth map, and sum like all of the uh, those white values or the edge values together to get the transparency of that particular uh, frame. And after that frame, uh, I sum the average trans I sum all the transparency like rewards and get an average score of them over the traversal of the in the space to get an average um, like um, rewards for the spatial transparency yeah uh, and these yeah this is the testing part yeah and for the generation part uh, the agent uses the policy a proximal policy optimization algorithms to learn a neural network that speeds out the um, like uh, the generation step one by one so for example like um, like this is the example to generate a wall placed at, uh, sorry, a column placed at uh, the location 5050 five, with a height of three meters. Yeah, this is how it generates the first uh, comments. And uh, also for the wall, um, yeah. So for, for the column, the, uh, the sorry, it, it generates at the location 5050, five, yeah and uh, has a head of three and the column uh, and on uh, the wall for the wall example, it generates a uh, wall at 0, 1, 2, 7, from 0 0.01 to 0.27 and has a head of five. Yeah, this is how I represent the entire system. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, as you can see, all of each of the generations that can be re represented with a 
uh, like a five by one vector, and the neural network learns the how uh, learns to predicts the next like value of generation based on the previous based on the history of the generation and also the rewards that it gets from each generation epoch. Oh, sorry, from each yeah from each generation epoch. Yeah, yeah. This is sort of like the training process of uh, how the agents um, navigates around one of the generated spaces after the space is assembled by the grasshopper component. It's sort of like very speed up. Um, uh, yeah, so there are some other experiments that I did. Uh, so first I tested that on the 2D spaces, but it seemed to struggle a little bit in the generation step because um, like there are just too many like little transparency elements. Uh, like, yeah, like uh, you you might have more columns in scattered around the space that can create this kind of special transparency, but it doesn't create any phenomenal transparency as a result. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is also this is the training process for the for the two D part. Yeah, it doesn't really converge really well, uh, and uh, things get really interesting when it comes to three D. Uh, yeah, like you as you can see in the end, it just generates like a long wall and several columns so those can generate a lot of edges for sure um yeah and for the 3d part that's where the really interesting part come comes in because you have uh, more uh like variations of your design such as the, the you can have a floating slab on top of a, of a column or on top of a wall so this in in this presets we we can see a lot of like interesting uh like results um after like certain training steps yeah, so first of all, it's still a mess, like a huge mess. Uh, and a lot of the spaces are not, not even accessible at all. Uh, yeah, but after like a certain period, you can see that the, it has more walkable spaces and more floating slabs uh, as a balance of the accessibility scores and also the like uh, the having like enough edges or transition of depths between spaces. Um, yeah, and after 700 episodes, I didn't have enough time to train this further uh, due to the limitation of the projects. Uh, it generates like a, like this kind of like space that has more floating slabs and uh, also some like a, uh, like columns, but with like uh, far less walls um, so that it sort of like has this kind of like transitional spatial depth inside its perspectival traversal. Uh, yeah, that's basically the the outcome of my thesis projects. And I created this, I also made it like sort of like a human AI cooperative game where you can also uh, like manipulate the the generation of the game um, using, you can call the APIs of the, uh, of, of or you, you as a human. And also you can let the AI to generate the results as well. Yeah, and it was, it's showing the weird, uh, like uh, edge detection of the death map in real time in this two view, huge billboards, billboards. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much I have to say today. Um, and I think one thing that I has always been my, like, um, uh, inspiration of starting architecture and AI is the the is Adam Turner's work. Uh, and I think the way he thinks about intelligence is really like a uh, fascinating and, uh, I would like to end my presentation with the quote from Alan Turing as well, that uh, presumably the child brain is something like a notebook as one by it from the stationers, um, rather little mechanisms and a lot of branches. So I think this way of having less predefined notions or having less restrictions of explicit knowledge is about uh, AI, and our, AI um, agents is sort of like really like groundbreaking in terms of the research process. You can find this paper in the digital access to scholarship at Harvard. It has my the full paper uh, posted there. Uh, yeah, and also feel free to connect on all these social medias, uh, like if you want. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wanted to thank uh, um, the uh, IDD organization again for this uh, invitation and this great opportunity to uh, share share my understanding with you on to uh, like communicate or thoughts about the uh, journey of AIS uh, uh, in general. And um, yeah, so thanks for watching. That's all from my part, yeah. Thank you, Renja.
Um, I, I think it's really incredible and I'm personally really intrigued by how you compare um, how you testing everything in unity um, instead of only like doing experiment in grasshopper and rhino. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally have a question because um, you use human centric uh, ways in unity to uh, exam all, all these like generated flaws and columns. But like uh, the way you the, the way you use it is like um you uh experiment with the transparency um but only this way is actually for the machine so it's not you're using real people um that examine it, this thing through VR in Unity mm -hmm. but you actually use machine to generate a rule that de uh, depends on all kinds of depth detection. Uh, about the transparency so you're actually using a machine a machinery way to do uh a, like a human tax so what about your next stop so <laughs> are you going to improve this um yeah thank you Lee, for the question um yeah I, I, I would like to say that um so i think this system itself is probably like uh, in a sense, a um, like flexible or you know, like something that you can plug different uh, evaluation metrics into. That's why I use reinforcement learning and also uh, create this uh, first very simple rules of uh, computing the like transparency or accessibility because you can add other metrics such as the um, energy efficiency or the lighting, the lighting uh, or other perceptible um, like metrics. For example, you can Add a real human um, humanoid avatar into the into the scene, and also compute the comfort at the humanoid uh, avatar during the runtime. So that's what I think is really interesting about using reinforcement learning. That is, you can add different other metrics to the reward function, uh, but you might also like uh, practically you might also want to break break this uh, training task into different parts so that it can convert easily. Like for example, using like a method like curriculum learning so that it can learn different objectives at different stages. And um, yeah, and uh, spit out one general agent. So yeah, that's for like uh, my thoughts about how this can go in the future. Like you can definitely plot more rewards functions or evaluation metrics computationally to this, um, yeah, to this uh, like methodology, yeah. Looking forward to it. Any yeah. other questions? I have a question on the a comment. Uh, firstly, uh, I just have a, a comment for your presentation. Uh, thank you for the uh, detailed in, for your in detailed introduction. But I think uh, there are twenty minutes. It's a little bit too long. No, do you understand? And. Uh, uh, another thing is that, uh, could you please repeat your contribution of your research? Uh, yeah, so um, I think the, like, uh, for this thesis, it doesn't really have, uh, it doesn't really have enough evidence of, um, like, to prove that it uh, works well for the uh, conditions, but generally is, um, I, I think for the 3D parts, it generates, uh, it, or it's kind of like biased to a certain level of generating the more slabs and uh, flo more floating slab, and also, um, how do I say that? Um, the like um, intercepting columns or walls, so that it can um, have more transitions of uh, depths of uh, per sorry, more transitions of depths instead it, during its uh, traversal process of the floor plan. Yeah, that's sort of like the conclusion of this. Uh, this paper, yeah, it's learning from a random states of generation, and then sort of ends in a in a sort of like, uh, sort of like a der derivative, um, design direction, yeah. Uh, so from from, uh, from my point of view, you just uh, proposed a. Uh, New model or a tool to solve the problem, but uh, actually the problem. Uh, maybe I I ha I have another simple problem. What 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 is the problem you solve? Uh, yeah, I think as a thesis project, it uh, sort of like doesn't really solve any practical architectural problems, but rather propose a new methodology. 
of generative AI or, or generative architecture. Um, like, yeah, so it assembles the different, it sort of like actually create this environment of uh, training the assemblage agents um, in using the game engine, if you if you mean that's what the, the research problem, yeah. I think Rinja is more to um, provide an, a game engine like Unity or other like human-centric environments um, to re-examine the grasshopper generate uh, architecture elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if you're familiar with like uh, reinforcement learning researches, uh, like it, this one is sort of like sort of similar to the Mujuko simulator that UC Berkeley proposed uh, for a lot of like intuitive physics training environment. So um, yeah, it's actually just, it's sort of like a foundational um, level of stuff that it builds the toolbox or sandbox for uh, reinforcement learning environment in architecture, yeah. But we research don't yet have that sort of sandbox. Yeah, that's what the main research question was, I think. Uh, I didn't have enough time to turn that into a research paper, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, if that's if this is not like a paper because it's more of like a thesis project and more explorative. But I think, yeah, um, thanks for bringing this up, Robert, uh, Robert and I think, um, yeah, to make it a paper, it definitely needs to have a more clear definition of the research problem. And, yeah, thanks so much for the comment. Yeah. And really apologize for the timing. I'm sorry. I didn't, I thought it was going to be like one hour or something. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, Ria. Uh, thanks yeah. for your introduction about the uh, deep learning part. And my, my, my question is about the, the, the beam system. And it seems that you build, a, a, I mean, um, representation data structure. Uh, in uh, with a beam structure, but is there any link with a different uh, architecture element uh, with each other? I mean, a message passing network, something like the, the, the message passing network uh, in GN, the, the, the age link. Do you understand my 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 question? Yeah, um, I yeah, I don't, I didn't yet have uh, enough time to build like the comprehensive beam system, but I only built the very, it's sort of like a, it's, I, I wouldn't really call it a beam system today, because it's, okay. but it's sort of like a symbolic system where you, um, it's it's representing the command side of the generation mm -hmm. in some way, like a, pro, I would I would rather call it like a procedural system, uh, or a like a. Mm, yeah, procedural DSL for the architecture. It's not necessarily like a, the these beam system as we see today, like the IC, IFC, uh, like data structure or like the Revit. It's not like comprehensive beam system. It's just representing, he taking concepts from beam that you can use the parameters yes. to represent the architecture elements. So yeah, I will actually call it like a parametric, uh, like procedural DSL for, for architecture spaces, yeah. But and my question is, the, is yeah. do, do you think Sorry. it's very important to make a, a, a hierarchical relationship between the elements? Uh, do you think uh, with, in this way it's better than just uh, with a, uh, I mean, parametric uh, ways? For example, I, you use C and the C convolutional uh, uh, ruler can uh, make some, I mean, connections with uh, the, your, your neighbors and the element and you use GN, there's a nice message passing that work. But in, 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 in the, your beam hierarchical uh, data representation part, there's no link between the element and the element. And when you, uh, and when you get the loss of the, your loss function, reward function, there's no message pa passing from this element. For example, I move this, this this room to another side and there's no message passing from this room to uh, its neighbors <laughs> to understand my question it's hard to um, explain in English. i know but um so why this pro uh, procedural grammar is is it's sort of like um it's not having that message passing or the i know what you're trying to represent it's like the uh what, how to say it? the spatial spatial relationship between the different uh, like elements of the data representation. Um, I, th I will argue that uh, for this part, like since this is like a reinforcement learning process and mm -hmm. uh, 
to my generation agent actually takes in the previous uh, commands when it generates the next step. It's sort of like a uh, like a, a auto regressive pattern that it takes in the previous steps to predict the next step. Uh, yeah. So uh, and also the reward function, it's uh, it's like when you're doing the gradient descent, the reward function will also have it will also like optimize the uh, how to say the um, it's not exactly like recurrent neural network, but it's sort of like it has the um, the uh, the it has sort of like optimized the gradients um, of the previous step as well. So it's not only just uh, generating a random step one at a time. Yeah, that's that's why I would say the sort of like the implicit okay. relationship. But I think this okay. is not the optimal representation as well, because uh, it's for now the procedural grammar is just a, such a small data set. Yeah. Sorry, it's such a small chunk of generation, and we should have take into consideration more other elements as well, like windows or other openings. And yeah, um, okay, yeah. I'm also trying okay. to find the optimal representation. I think that's a sort of like a ongoing <laughs> discussion as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and there's one more question um, in the chat. So the pipeline is generating models from Grasshopper and then import them to Unity for under testing automatically. And I'll say yes. And what's the related library in Unity for reinforcement learning in this process? Oh yeah. Um. So for Rhino Grasshopper ICP, um, there's um something called Rhino Inside. So uh, like in the latest version of Rhino, you can um plug Rhino process to something else like the uh, either Unity or Revit, uh, that's how I do the SAP process. Uh, sorry, IPC, sorry, in, in, yeah, IPC process between the two applications. Um, and for Unity reinforcement learning, it's just using the ML agent uh, in, of Unity. So it's sort of like open source library for uh, reinforcement learning. It's using its own like machine learning frameworks called Procuda. And yeah, uh, that's how I did the reinforcement learning part. Okay, thanks, Renjia, for all the presentation and Q and section. And next, we're excited to have Xi Mingzhong to introduce his recent research on discussion on urban layouts workflow with generative AI. And Xi Mingzhong is a PhD candidate at Aalto University, where he has been awarded at a public doctoral scholarship. His master's school is Politecnico di Milano, Italy, and he's the recipient of the Global Gold Scholarship from Politecnico di Mil Milano. His main research area are deep learning, architectural design, um, graph neural networks, and nerve, VN, and 3D reconstruction, human-machine fusion, architectural decision-making, reinforcement learning to meet architects' preference, environmental perception of complex spaces, and design institution machine learning. So that's welcome, Simi. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen now. Can, can you see my screen now? Yes. Without the speaker note, right? Right. OK, OK. <sighs> I'm Xi Mingzhong, and it's my honor to be here to share my project. And I focus on human machine collaboration for 3D special design. Please feel free to get to know me and connect me through the website above. And before we talk about machines, we can look at the design process of human architect. We human perceive the 3D environment. We understand and reason about the design element in our brain. We, we, we see from our eyes. And then based on this reason, the knowledge, we make design decisions. Finally, we obtain a design prototype. What, what, what I want to explore today is how machine can work with humans to reason about a special layout. This can be summarized in three parts, perception, reasoning, and decision making in 3D world. Could machine replace human in this 3D, uh, in, in this 3 process? And since uh, long ago, we have been exploring how machine can understand and design prototype just like human do. This is the shape, syntax machine, human understand the design requirement and specify the rules. 
Then the machine searches for the root output, the geometry drawing, we call this Rubik's method. And this is an interesting case of Markov random fields and Gibbs sampling. Uh, the machine sample rules from one case study and generate generate new designs, although this is also rule-based, but the idea of learning the rules from the case study and uh, applying them to the new result can already be called a pre air idea. And this is also a rule-based approach where humans and machines are involved in the process. We call this human in the loop. This is our paper, Human Machine Cooperation for 3D Special Layout based on uh, adjacency relationships. We made a, a plugin for Rhino. The task of the computer is to optimize the position of the modulars based on the adjacency and the dimensional requirements of the of different spaces. And the architect task is to modify the model to be more in line with the traditional modeling process. A human and machine work together to complete the layout. Uh, I always believe that the professional interaction process of the architect is valuable, so that the in Interaction process modifies the weight of the vector in the in the in the rule based methods, thus allowing the rules to evolve until the consistent con consistently made the architect pre preference. In a rule based driven process, rules can also be changed, and this is the result of our three D layout. It's mainly a, a, a access the space dimensions. Uh, this leads us to the limitation of the rule-based approach, we cannot turn all the design contact and the complex implicit con constraints into a rule function. So a machine cannot reason and understand as deeply as a human brain in rule-based method because the rules are too simplified. And a large number of data-driven approaches, uh, approach, approaches be began to take over the field of architecture prototyping and generation. For example, GAN. The data-driven approach does not require the definition of clear rules, but it can learn from the rules from the data site. The now work of GAN is now new to anyone. The generators and discriminator work against each other until the generator can produce a data distribution that uh, closely uh, to, to the data site. We can take a quick look at the studies GAN has been widely used for urban design layout. For example, road ne network layout, garden layout, house layout, and urban layout. By the way, this is a tense paper. We found two common points from uh, those uh, researches. The first is the way the architect controls AI is through a pre-data labeling process. For example, in tense research, we can control the building layout by input different uh, boundaries. And second, the good or bad result learned by GAN depended heavily on the data site. Uh, large data sets are difficult to obtain. Data labeling is also a very uh, difficult process. We ask uh, two questions here. Does similarity mean good design? Well, again, models are adapted at uh, quickly producing results that are similar to the historical urban symbols. It, it's difficult to meet arch architecture's future custom layout requirements by only producing results that are similar to historical symbols. So the, the similarity is not enough. And second, it's difficult for a machine to generate a low density result from a high density urban data site. Also in order to generate a result that meet our future design standard, we need a lot of manual selection rather than random sampling. The, the machine needs explicit data set future labeling and data filtering to be able to control the GAN re result well. And this is the training process of the GAN. GAN network is designed to generate uh, similar data distributions, but, but, but the data relationships alone are missing message, message passing process in this network. This is a GAN fitting process. We can find the gradient of each point we find that the generator function can turn a random simple uh, distribution into a, a, a distribution similar to the data set. In the GAN network, we have many functions, gradient functions, as you can see in the picture. But does this function represent a well-designed rule, like Rubens method for good design? 
and we can see the GAN can quickly turn a random noise into a ring shape using a generator. The distribution of this ring is similar to the real data. But when we look closely at the points on the ring, we have no way to explain the relationship between each point. We cannot relate too much on the distribution of this implicit features. It is necessary to be defined some explicit features to allow the machine to understand the architecture design intentions and the way the data is labeled determines the way architect and the AI work together in, in GAN network. This is why data labeling and data filtering are so important. And how to, de how to design a specific sampling and automatic feature extraction framework that helps architecture to explicit control the hierarchical urban layout features and meet complex urban design needs is our concern. As an architect, we need to control what to study and how to study. This is quite uh, abstract. Let's take an example. So we ask the GAM machine to generate a design uh, competition proposal for the Milan. We, we can look at this brief. brief. Uh, we need a high density functional they reach low height, uh, more green area, residential and mixed uh, use the urban design. And the government's brief also summarizes uh, some requirements for specific um, morphological features of the city, such as open boundaries, uh, open occupation uh, boundaries and something. We make an uh, assumption if we can automatically filter the city data by the design requirements and the features of the city are automatically extracted for data targeting, then we can better control the urban layout. Architect can work uh, better with the game. This is our process. We need to do uh, the first step is case filtering and then extracting morphological features and uh, targeting, and we can get a 3D prototype of urban design when architect enters new control element and the relationships. This is my third step one. We download the urban data from OSM and automatically filtering the data. For example, we can filter out low density urban forms from OSM. And then we can automatically analyze and extract uh, urban morphological features and uh, target the data. And then we train GAN model. And of course, we want to architect to be able to use these layers hierarchical urban morphological morphological features to control the generate 3D result. And this is a simple of 4,000 uh, 4, cases were selected that meet the standard of function uh, density and uh, functional diversity and the heat. The choice of morphological features, Cole Roy has used the feature map to teach his, his students how to complete the analysis of the cities and the urban design in the past. And nowadays, maybe this process can be done by machine learning. So we choose these morphological features from uh, the, the Colin Royce ID here. And an example on the left side is urban feature map. It has design marks for the boundaries, open spaces, openings, road networks, uh, something like that. And on the right side is a map of the real city. The map on the left, we can understand as a maker for human understanding and the reasoning about the urban design. And let's see urban features definition from the book learning from Las Vegas. And boundaries, and road network intersections, openings in the boundaries, open space and building relationship. So inspired by the feature map, we have formed our feature network hierarchical ne ne network to control the morphological layout. We believe that this important features should be analyzed and extracted. And we hope that the GAN can learn the hierarchical relationship between these features. We have automatically marked and learned about urban features. We have uh, compressed the feature in the blue channel and the heat in the green channel so the 3d volume and the functional distribution of the city can also be learned automatically and this is the input and output screen we input the nodes of the space and to get the layout of the road and the open spaces and we can generate a 3d layout by modifying the 
row network and set features, we can see that with the layers uh, features, the architect can better control the urban layout, meeting the uh, metrics of the competition's mission statement. GAN does not learn the implicit features of the building distribution or data distribution. It also learns the uh, exploited uh, uh, hierarchical morphology features. And we can control these features. And in the results section, first, we verify the functional diversity and the density. Uh, the result produced by the machine meets the requirements of our task from the beginning. And then the machine uh, production 3D volume and function distribution. Again, we made it a, a Rhino plugin. Ar architects can work with AI to create a special layout in the same way that the, the, the jaws, the, the CD, and again, can design the shape and the function of the building. Then we ref refine the modulars and landscapes. Uh, by the way, thanks to the 3D detailed model generation, we can use machine learning of the wind environment for landscape design. It's another paper we did two years ago. And this is finally out an uh, urban design guided by the architect with features input and the standards input and machine finish the layout process. And some limitations. Have you ever wondered why would not apply GAN to generate new drugs for experimentation. Would you dare to take a new drug if it uh, was a GAN machine learning generation? This is because the explanation of the GAN model is very poor. And GAN's convolutional model, you can recognize any graphic. But when it is so difficult to truly understand a human reasoning task, such as a Sudoku or, or, or chess or something like that, human reasoning task. Uh, so this is a question about the, my, my previous uh, paper, I think. Uh, how do we ensure that the machine actually understand the, the design message we input in 3D space and it can reason and perform reasoning tasks like Sudoku in 3D space rather than just uh, providing a similarity uh, data distribution? Uh, let's take a brief look at a, a gene graph neural network. A graph, a gene is made up of nodes and edge. Many of the studies around us can be modeled using gene networks, for example, the cities, human relationships in real world. And we, we know how messages are passed between each node and the result of the calculations. It is also possible to know better the details inside the black box. And in the Layout application building gun uh, is the same author with the whole scan uh, in, in Tian's presentation. And the architect uh, can enter a complete diagram structure of the design requirement, which can be combined with GN and GAN to produce a 3D voxel model. But there are still some problems with this approach. The first, when the architect needs to reason and, and input the, the complete spatial structure. By the time I, I, I already know the structure of the space in my head, the design has almost been reasoned out. The, the, the task has almost finished. And second, the control capability is not precise to each unit space size. Inspired by this, the question is, can machine in, intelligence and human intelligence uh, be connected through a, a faster network to explore new prototypes together? We know human and machine have their own advantages. Can GN, uh, this network, be our partner in solving the challenges of 3D building shape exploration and the special segmentation? And this is building GN is our new product uh, project of us, uh, accepted by ICADI this year. For now, sorry, I can only show some part of this result and ideas here. The architect can input incomplete uh, volumes and uh, partial ideas, including constraints and site context. These volumes are then transformed into a matrix of special nodes, and the GN is able to reason about detailed special design solutions. And why is important? The architect can engage the you know, feedback loops with AI to jointly explore and optimize design solutions. Not only AI is used to speed up the design process, 
but the architect's per perception and understanding of the site is also be used to assist AI in interactively exploring the 3D building layout results. And this is a challenge. In the past, uh, in the previous uh, study, um, it's a big challenge. If you want to solve the complex the constraint and the long-term de dependency problem for highly accurate and reason networks, uh, only GN are not enough. For example, how can a machine learn relationship between room A and B if there's no obvious graph relationship between these two nodes? Uh, the A is a toilet, the B is a, the, the, a classroom. And when when that in architecture design, when I change the A position and A size, uh, the information will be uh, passed to B in our brain. But for computer, if you do not make a, a link, directly graph link, uh, there's no message passing network or message passing ways to for, for machines to understand what happened inside the, the, the two graph. So we combine the special graph networks and memory networks are uh, here we use GRU and, and building GN network is created for reasoning the unit relationship in 3D network. So how here are some simple examples to show on the right are some of our uh, idea inputs some 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 volume on the left is a complete reasoning result by GN network and we can see that GN network has a mind of its own it will change the human design to meet functional and the traffic uh, requirements uh, it, it's not like the Ruby is a method. We set some rules with these rules. The, the, the machine will follow this rule step by step and generate uh, the geometry. Uh, but, but in GN network, it will change the wrong things uh, in latent space and uh, it will change the human's uh, started uh, volume input. Uh, we experiment uh, with the uh, model on different buildings. GN itself can uh, reason some, some uh, it, it has some reasoning intelligence and this intelligence can be controlled quantitatively with our our GRU uh, module with the RN we can choose how much the machine intelligence and human intelligence to use to combine together if you need more detail and information please follow the ICADI conference this year it's not uh, published uh, yet, so I can just uh, show you part of this idea. And that's all, thank you. Okay, thanks, Ximing. And now we come to the Q&A section. Do you have any questions for Ximing? Oh, hello. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Please. I just have a comment. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, the theme, uh, you spend too much time on introduction and you, you introduce a lot of related works. Um, I think um, a better academic presentation should focus on your own contribution. Mm, that's the first comment. The second comment is that uh, I think your pronunciation has a lot of um, problems. For example, you read uh, uh, data. Uh, you, you, I remember you read it that, that as data. So, okay. uh, yeah, that, yeah, there are a lot of things I think you need to improve if, if you want to be a, a better, uh, want to have a better academic career. Um, 
So currently, that's my comments. Thank you. Okay, so so I finished work. Okay, if um if we don't have like further questions, um we can say if, if we have other questions, please please feel free to uh, join our WeChat group for following up. Or if you are watching the live streaming on YouTube or Bilibili platform, please feel free to contact the author Xi Mingzhong or um or Runjia via their email. And we are highly encourage uh, encourage any young designers and scholars to share your work and projects and current research on our platform. And you can um, see all the informations on our website. And thank you again for joining Innovations in Digital Design webinar. And thank you all.